Hi everybody, good afternoon. Welcome to the Legs Matter Lounge. Um, this is, I'm Joanne Casey, I'm a podiatrist and this is Neris Pierce. Hi. Um, she's, <laughs> she's our guest today. Um, we, this session is called Finding Resilience in the Face of Adversity and I couldn't think of a better person to actually join me today to talk about all of this. I just would like to start though in actually saying that I have a conflict of interest here because Neris is a friend of mine. And I met Neris uh, in Helsinki uh, and we were going to a swimming event. We were gonna swim the Arctic Circle together. And uh, Neris was sat in the bar uh, at the hotel. And uh, yes, you were in the bar, uh, chatting to everybody in the bar. And uh, I hadn't met Neris at this point. And we, we turned up and I just said to her, how did you get on, how did you get here? And she said, oh, I flew in. Um, but she goes, that was awful. And I was like, what do you mean that was awful? And she said, well, they didn't have any uh, assistance for me to get onto the plane. And Neris is in a wheelchair. And I thought, well, how did you get into the plane? And she said, well, I actually hauled myself up the ladder. And I remember thinking, what a woman. She just hauled herself up a ladder onto the aeroplane. And so the, top, the reason we've asked Neris to come and talk today is a little bit about how she's managed to uh, deal with the trauma that she had and how she's the wonderful woman that she is today. Somebody, <laughs> somebody who has swum the Arctic Circle, somebody who's had, and I won't disclose all of it just yet because I'll let her do that in a bit, but somebody who's got more sporting uh, awards, accolades than myself, than most people I know. Um, so actually, I'd just like to say hello to Neris and thank you so much for joining us this afternoon for this talk. It's a pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> Neris, just, uh, just to give a little bit of background context to why we've asked you to come today, do you mind just spinning yourself back, what is it, 20, 20 years? Ooh, not, no, maybe well, not as old as that. You're not as old as How that. How old am I? 15, 15 years, <laughs> back to when you were 27. And if you don't mind just telling us a little bit of information about where you were in your life at that point and then what happened to get you to where you are today. Sure. Um, yeah, so I was serving in the British Army, uh, a combat medic, um, and had an amazing career. Um, I mean, I got paid to travel around the world doing crazy sports that I love, downhill skiing, triathlons, running up massive mountains. But my actual serious job was teaching the guys going out onto the front line how to try and save their best mate on their worst day. And it was a very special job um, that, you know, I'm forever uh, lucky and gifted to have been able to do. Um, so uh, on October the 23rd, uh, 2008, I popped out on my motorbike because you might have guessed from the sports list that I've just said, I'm a bit of an adrenaline junkie, but this time was actually sensible. So um, I took my sensible bike out, which was the Kawasaki 500, fully armoured motorbikes, helmet, boots, jackets, everything, you know, um, doing less than 10 miles an hour. And suddenly from nowhere, poof, car took me out from basically the side of me and they'd reversed off the curb from behind a solid sided bus stop when they still, you know, can't see through. And um, yeah, my life changed at that point forever. But it was a really weird journey because at that point in time, you know, I'd fallen off mountains, no exaggeration. Um, I'd broken, you know, the majority of bones that are possible to break uh, easily, um, crashing. Um, and they always fixed, you know. And so, yes, I got hit by a car. My legs were crushed. I dislocated my right shoulder. My head smashed into the side panel of the car. But it's always OK. It always fixes. And it slowly started to dawn on me over probably 12 months that this wasn't going that way for some reason. And essentially the legs um, had been crushed, the bones fixed perfectly fine, but the nerve crush damage in my legs was um, slowly getting worse and worse really. Um, and my nerves were destroying themselves on top of the damage that I'd already taken. So I got diagnosed with neurological um, injuries, obviously to my legs, and then a neurological condition uh, now known as complex regional pain syndrome and spent 12 months in and out of hospital, different treatments and went in for a spinal block and, you know, thought nothing of it. I mean, millions of women have this each year uh, during childbirth, 
And, you know, the idea was that if the pain was stopped and the neurological condition stopped progressing, then they'd look at a more permanent solution. Uh, so I went in, was having some other surgery done as well. So, you know, went underneath the, you know, anesthetic and was completely peaceful. And when I woke up, suddenly dawned on me that I didn't hurt. For the first time in 14 months, I didn't hurt. And I was ecstatic. But it also felt weird because I felt like I was tied to the bed. And the consultant came over and I started thanking him because this was the first time. And if I didn't hurt, I could have my career back, my job back, my, you know, everything, my sports, my family, my friends. And then he said to me, nurse, I'm sorry, but you reacted really badly to the drug, caused a spinal bleed and we paralyzed you from the chest down. And again, it just didn't sink in. I kept thanking him because I didn't hurt. And it probably took about six to eight months for me to really realize what that one statement was going to mean. And it was going to mean I was paralyzed from the chest down in a wheelchair for the rest of my life, that I could no longer go to the loo without faffing and, you know, drugs and this, that and the other, that my career, my sports were definitely gone. And I suppose most devastatingly was my place in my family. Uh, you know, you over the years grow kind of a balance that works for your family and your friends and in an instant gone and I suppose it was about four years that I was bed bound it affected my blood pressure I was on steroids a ton of nerve drugs um, that meant that I wasn't really making any sense I put on um, eight and a half stone um, and was literally just a, a creature existing in a bed um, that had 24-hour carers and my life was done. Um, you know, I tried to commit suicide because I really felt that my friends and family would be better if I wasn't here because they weren't going to have to show up each day um, and spend time on me when I was never going to be anything. And my life was, you know, done. This charity walked in, this massive guy, I still remember, I'm lying in my own bed at home, all the carers, machines. He walks in and he's like six foot four and he goes, you're going skiing with Blesma and it's in Colorado, America. And he just walked back out. I was just like, what on earth? It's like a lunatic. <laughs> and needless to say, this amazing charity called Blesma, a few weeks later, had me first class BA flying me out to America, Denver, carers my sister and I was going to go skiing and I had no idea how this was going to happen because I was bed bound couldn't be in my wheelchair for more than a couple of minutes without fainting and now suddenly they were going to put me at the top of a mountain but you know too drugged out of my face to really argue off I went and when I landed there the mountains were breathtaking. I was back to competing in the army, those blue skies, the jagged mountains, the sun beating off the snow, you know, and my heart lifted, you know, this used to be me. About two hours later, I absolutely hated it. Now, most of you uh, will probably heard of a weeble toy, the, you know, those round bottom toys that kind of fall over one way, bounce back up, fall over the other, weeble, 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 that was me. I literally moved 20 meters in about, I don't know, two hours. And I was at the point of just get me out of this stupid contraption. So essentially they'd strapped me into a ninja turtle shell, clipped me onto one singular ski and kind of gone, there you go, with no abs and no balance, uh, yeah, ski. And I begged them to let me out. The ski instructor came over, grabbed hold of my jacket, was like, just put some effort in. And that was it. I was gone. I was like, what? This guy can't see that I want to love this. I want this to be me. And every time I fall, I hate myself and I hate my disability more and more. And I took a deep breath and I thought, sod this. I'm, that's it. I'm going. I want to away from this guy. And off I was. Got to the bottom and I turned around to him and said, just get me out. But he wasn't there. He's unclipping his skis about 50 metres away, running over like some Bambi. 
he turned his camera around, pressed play. And in that moment, he changed my life because he hadn't skied me to the bottom. I skied myself to the bottom. And if I could do that, what else could I do? Mm. And I suppose that's where my journey to meeting Joe and competing and, you know, getting to the point of, you know, now I've competed for Great Britain, Wales, I hold nine world records. And I never could have imagined that, you know, when I was laying bed bound, wanting to end it, you know. And so I owe everything to the people around me and crazy people like Joe who are willing to go, OK, paralyze some chest down and you're going to get into a fast flowing river. I don't know you, but that sounds like a great idea, <laughs> you know, and just going with it because it takes my friends and my family to go with the flow and to also struggle with the things as you heard Joe talk about the first time I met her I'd had to drag myself up a set of metal stairs and back down again to get on and off the plane because it was either that or don't go and you know it's so it's a constant battle but the people around me having good humor and um a very thick skin definitely helps I mean there is it's it I've probably said this to you before, many times before, but it's an, ab- it's an absolute pleasure to really, to know you and to see your ambition and your, and your desire. And I, and I know, and for me, actually, as your friend, it's difficult sometimes to actually watch. We had this discussion the other day. It's difficult for me not to go, how can I help you? How can I do this? <laughs> but actually, you're more than capable the whole time. And I have to keep telling myself that. But one of the things, I guess, you know, if, is that when you go and do these things, the precautions you have to take to make sure you don't get injured. So for example, when we did go and swim in the Arctic Circle, um, both uh, you swim skins. So for people that don't know, that's without a wetsuit. So Nera swims without a wetsuit. She doesn't need any buoyancy aids. Now that's a very controversial sort of just statement (laughs) I've just made there. She doesn't need a buoyancy aid wetsuit. She can swim perfectly on her own. But of course, because you're paralyzed from just above your belly button, isn't it? Yeah, from my chest. Just yeah, my bra, bra your, strap. your legs, your legs sink, don't they? They, they don't do. float. So yeah. you use a toe float to lift your legs up. Um, but actually, in these kind of competitions, you can't use floats. So of course, in this river, um, I remember Neris was concerned that her feet would drag on the floor and maybe hit some of the rocks at the bottom. So you know, thinking about. I mean, with having neuropathy, which you've just said you, that you have, the healing process is slower. So any injuries that you get, like grazes from the rocks, yeah. along the river, is actually going to take you twice, three times, or you four times as long as something else. Yeah. So of course, you know, but those are the kind of considerations that you have to take into place. Yet you still do it. You still <laughs> find the drive. You have to be slightly crazy. <laughs> I mean, there's something called FOMO, isn't there? Fear of missing out. <laughs> well, you don't that, you? You can't, I can't <laughs> sit on the sidelines. Where would the fun be in that? <laughs> but, you know, you're completely right that um, even sitting in my wheelchair, which, you know, you kind of take, you know, the same as you guys standing on your legs or in shoes, you have to make sure that your shoes fit properly, that your socks go on properly. If you have a, a neurological deficiency or some form of um you know problem that makes your leg skin or the bone or muscle or whatever more susceptible to breaking down you have to take that extra care and even a wheelchair that's designed obviously to paralyze people I still have to be aware of how long I've sat in it how long since I transferred have I shifted and my legs at an angle because of when you're struggling with neuropathy any amount of pressure against you know, one point, solid point in your, your leg can form a, a, a pressure sore. Um, and you won't know about it. That's the you thing. You don't even it? know about it. The same as with diabetic ulcers, you know, before you know it, you look down and, you know, you've got this massive hole in your leg. And I completely, uh, you know, I've had to deal with things like that because, as you said, I scratched my feet in that uh, swimming competition and, you know, that was six months mm. from, from really tiny, small little cuts of having to specially dress it, make sure that it was cleaned, make sure that I was changing my socks and my shoes, taking my shoes off so I got air to the wound. You know, all of those things. And, you know, I know you find it quite, um, you know, kind of uh, head messing that I have to set an alarm to yes. turn over at night every three hours 
but yeah. again it's that constant pressure and where I don't have any muscle on my hip bones the side of my knees the side of my ankles those places the bone literally presses through the skin and if I don't take the pressure off for every three hours essentially I'm stopping the blood flow and that area of skin dies um, so it's definitely been something I've had to learn to do and I've had to relearn to take care of part of myself that I felt on kind of I felt let down by I expected my legs and my neurological issue to fix and when my body didn't fix I felt betrayed by it um, you know so for a good few years and the time that I suffer from pressure sores was when I almost tried to dissociate myself from the part of my body below my my bra line below my chest because that part of my body now was what had destroyed my life um and trying to fall in love with all of you again enough to take care of a part of you that you can't feel um that you can't use you know I have to massage my feet every night because they've been sat down in that down position all day and of that because there's no muscle movement they fill with fluid and you know so it's about taking that time on an area of your body that you can't feel and you were betrayed by and it really took me a long time to, to get my head around that and that actually it was learning to care about all of myself again. So I guess if there's people out there that have found themselves in situations like yours where you felt your world was taken away you thought that you wouldn't be able to live life in the same way as you did before I mean you've 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 gone to an interest of yours haven't you an old hobby sports being outdoors um is that the sort of thing that you'd advise other people to think about what is it that you enjoyed before and try and find a way to adapt into that new life really for certain some of it is about adapting but other things is about looking outside of what you were before um, because you can always make yourself a better version of you um, so before I was army, I was sports, I was climb up big mountains, uh, run as fast as I could until I threw up, um, you know, and that was kind of what I found bizarrely pleasurable saying that out loud. Um, but, uh, you know, since my accident, yes, I definitely got back to my sports. But it's also been about discovering other parts of myself. Um, you know, I never would have spoken like this in public before my injury. Um, I got bullied at school. I was never any good at English, really bad dyslexia. And, um, you know, I just never would have considered speaking. And, you know, coming, uh, being injured made me kind of look at other things that I could do with my life to help me care and help other people. And when someone said to me, you know, some of that now could be talking about the struggles that you've had in an honest and open way um, and going away and learning how to do that and learning that I can draw. I mean, don't ask, uh, you're not getting any live demonstrations, Joe. but you know, the fact that I can draw and that I enjoy coloring in and that, you know, I was like, what? I mean, mm. arts and crafts never been my thing. Um, you know, far too ADHD, like, you know, crazy adrenaline seeking, far too busy. But actually, I found that it relaxes my head and gives me space. Um, going and doing singing, you know, never would have done that before my injury. Yeah, but, they're saying yeah. that recently, aren't they, about <laughs> singing? Singing is yeah. coming up. Yeah. Um, we, we've just got a question in the chat, Neris. It says, we, um, we've got many patients who lack the motivation to heal or to stop conditions getting worse. And this can be for a number of reasons, including low mood or self-doubt. Do you have any advice that you can give to people? I guess actually that's what we've just been chatting about, isn't it? Picking up another hobby and activity. There are other things though, um, you know, some, and I've struggled, I've spoken about it here with depression, anxiety, suicidal thoughts, you know, and it took me a long time to realise that it was okay to talk about that and that talking about it allowed you a way to start moving forwards and healing and you know lots of these people that do have maybe a chronic condition that's causing a wound to either not heal or you know it's it's tiring dealing with this day in day out mm. and you just want to go oh for god's sake just fix yourself and you know it's it's very hard because that then drags you down you go back to your doctor they say it's not any better they say you're not taking care of yourself 
And, you know, it's a really horrible, depressive cycle. Um, so definitely reaching out and speaking about the reasons that maybe you don't want to take care of yourself or that part of you, um, because it could be that they feel let down, um, you know, by that part of their body or by their history or just by luck. You know, I got hit by a 55 year old woman reversing off a curb. You know, it was just one of those things that happened. But, you know, you just you do get a little bit of the why me. So definitely reaching out and asking for help. Um, obviously, speaking to other people that have been in the situation, because it is all well and good. A doctor, a podiatrist, a medical specialist telling you that it's not healing the things that you need to do. But sometimes that's quite a hard thing to listen to. And speaking to medical professionals, you can feel kind of, you know, like you don't have the experience or maybe you know they're they're professionals and you're just this you know lowly kind of human with a with a leg problem and talking to other people from my point of view with spinal injuries and about the routines that they did and how it improved their lives and hearing about what it allowed them to do um really started showing me that actually my legs hadn't let me down my body hadn't let me down but that by not accepting it and not moving forward I was kind of holding myself in that pattern and I was stopping myself from having a life that I could ha still have mm. so there are lots of things involved but and coping strategies do you know what I've got one of the most amazing coping strategies here well, let's see and that is you know <laughs> Archie bug and when I'm feeling like I can't cope or I don't want to do it anymore or you know it just sitting with him purring and him just accepting me for who I am spinal injury and all and wheelchair you know just lifts my heart and goes right do you know what for my children for my family for my animal whatever it is I need to massage my legs I need to change my set of socks that came out wrong didn't it um and you know I need to make sure my shoes are on properly you know all of those things that my leggings aren't twisted that my seams are flat you know things and it gets it does feel tedious when you say it out loud when when it becomes a self-care routine it is easier somehow for me to deal with but I completely feel those people that and I still struggle with it now you know I was talking with you that I've been struggling with my mood and feeling depressed and you know less than and a burden again and we all do it you know whether you've got an injury a chronic condition we all as humans have up and down times and that's okay. It makes us human. Yeah. Um, and, but being able to talk about it or just take a minute to go, do you know, what? it is okay that I'm, I'm not on form today and not giving ourselves a hard time. And, you know, we were talking about self-criticism and self, you know, it, it is so hard um, to not allow that to become the habit and the habit to be smiling and having, taking joy in, the things around you it's um I, I remember asking you last year um what is it that drives you to so a little bit of background here neris uh, pushed her herself on in her hand cycle across america um how many miles is that neris hand bikes so oh, i hand cycled bikes, so. yeah my hand bike um 3072 miles and 180,000 feet of climbing Yes, you see. So, uh, so she's done that. She's attempted to swim the English Channel yeah, yeah. and has another date for that next year as well. And I remember saying to her, "You well on the hand cycle, you fell off, didn't you? You fell off and I you crashed. created a really I okay. crashed because I was going too fast down the mountain. Okay, and yet. then you, you got <laughs> yourself you got a really large leg wound, and that's where yeah. actually you started to come to me for some sort of professional advice. Yeah, um, and I think the professional advice to begin with was kind of why are you. <laughs> Why are you doing all these things? Um, apart from obviously the wound healing advice that we were able to give, <laughs> and then the pressure relief and the turning that we were all talking about. But I remember saying to you, why, what is it that drives you to do it? Wh why? Why is it that you want to push your, push your body like this? And I remember you said to me, because I want people who have an injury like mine to know that it's possible to actually get yourself to this point. You are yeah. a capable person. You've got the resilience in your mind to bring you back into the situations. You've got strong family support and you just had that drive to show other people that might end up in that position, which you were in, in 
2007 was it 2017 yeah <laughs> um where you were lying on the bed and you thought your life was gone and yet you want to show people that you can do these things these are, are, are these adventures are more than most people would ever dream of doing let alone somebody that's paralyzed from the spine down and i think that sort of drive is is really encouraging to see and I really as a friend uh, as a podiatrist as the legs matter coalition and I'm sure all of my colleagues would just applaud applaud that but Thank what's you. yeah what's what's interesting is is how you still you 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 manage you dip again you dipped recently and you're bringing yourself back up again so this is a constant isn't it and every yeah. day I mean I watch you wheel yourself up hills and think if I'm having a bad day and I don't want to walk up a hill today you've got to do it with just two limbs it's I'd like to say it's so much harder but I don't want that to sound as if you're any different to me because you don't see yourself as any different to me do you not really I mean it is different and you know I think that also took me some time to uh kind of get my head around that my life is different and I do have different struggles now but as for the emotional so see I told you he would uh, come for emotional support um the for the emotional kind of roller coaster you know I we had it and I had it before I got injured you know you'd have times where you felt on top of the world and then for no real reason uh, that you could put your finger on times where you felt not so great about yourself or about the situation so I do think it's a completely like human, normal, um, you know, mentality and, and things that our, our brain does. Um, but certainly for me, it's been about, you know, as you said, um, if I can show people that somebody paralyzed from the chest down can cycle across America with a team of wounded, injured and sick uh, women, then they can get out and play football with their kids for 10 minutes or lose that little bit of weight that they were wanting to or walk that extra bus stop or get out at lunchtime and see the local park you know the goals don't have to be massive but by my goals being massive it allows people to just see that small changes for them are possible um and you know i'm forever grateful in some ways to the accident and to the injury because it's allowed me to affect in a positive way people around me that I never met um, that I never will meet and obviously to have a positive impact on my family and friends still um, but you know I've, I've learned so much about myself since my accident that I never would have learned I feel without it um, and yeah my crazy goals were always me you know before I got injured it's got nothing to do with my injury uh, you know my choice of uh iron mans and so on before i got injured are just as as nuts but yeah for me it's about saying to people do you know what you can make small changes and make a massive difference to your life and by making a massive difference to your life making you happier you affect the people around you and you know it's that that spider's web that one person affects five others they affect five others and if we all make small changes to make each other happier to make the world kinder it sounds really cliche but that's kind of what like pushes me to pick you know really like mind-blowingly big <laughs> events um and sometimes not succeed you know I as Joe um, mentioned I tried to swim the English channel last September and got nine hours in or so and got dragged out the water talking about Harry Potter invisibility cloaks um because I had a hypothermia and a body temperature of 32 um So, you know, it doesn't always go to plan, but actually failure isn't final. You know, it's only final if you stop pushing forwards. And, you know, success also isn't final because you succeed at one thing and inevitably you want to succeed at something else. So always just keep pushing forwards. And for sure, small changes, small goals lead to amazing bigger things. I mean, one of the, the, the reasons um, we've, you know, we've asked you to come on today was to talk about your resilience, but also this week particularly is about legs matter. And it would almost seem that, well, legs matter, and we talk normally about the mobile legs. Yes. Your legs are immobile. Um, and actually, they almost matter more in a way 
because you need you're not even aware that they're there in some yeah. ways you've just spoken about thermoregulation and your body so that's all the neuropathy again kicking in so you know this neuropathy has affected your body it's affected your legs and actually to it's the importance then of your legs actually mattering because without what you know without your legs with wounds to your legs you then couldn't do half the things that you do you couldn't go and swim no. in the english channel if you had no. a muscle on your foot no. um you but know, also you could... it's so dangerous because before you realize there's a problem you're in hospital with sepsis or you're in hospital with a massive infection because if I don't look at my legs and visually inspect my legs and my back um, and the you know the areas that I can't feel where my bra strap sits you know anything from there down if I don't notice small wounds they get infected and turn into something massive and it's definitely been for me that looking over my body and taking care of all of my body has freed me from a lot of the problems I mean I still struggle I scratched my legs the other week doing a 24-hour charity swim in a, a sea pool out near uh, Clevedon Marine Lake it's called um, and I didn't realize there were barnacles in there it's the sea I'm not quite sure why I didn't figure that out um, <laughs> but my feet again dropped to the bottom and dragged and I scraped my feet up, you know, and only when somebody said to me, oh, my God, you're bleeding, Neris. Uh, when I got out, I was like, oh, great. Um, you know, and then it meant that I then for the rest of the swim had to be really aware of, you know, the depth and ask people how deep is it here? You know, because, again, those small wounds then meant that I had to use wound dressings and wound care um, and some antibiotics to get on top of it. And, you know, and I'll be healing that for the next four months. Mm. Um, so it definitely is that if I take a little bit of time each day, then it stops me spending large amounts of time either completely out of my wheelchair and out of the things I love or in hospital. Um, so I'd say to those people that are struggling with the motivation to look after a part of their body that is maybe has uh, some chronic or long term issues is that if you just take that little bit of extra time, it will save you months in, in the future. But again, that took me a very long time. It's easy for me to say now, but it took me a very long time to get a grip of, you know, and to actually really figure that out for myself. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's an absolute delight to, to have you on, on today on Legs Matter for this, for this session. And you're an, you're an absolute inspiration. I mean, I've said that to you several times and, and, you, and I'll probably continue to say that again and again and again. And I'll continue to worry when you get in and out of a car, when you end up swimming, when you, you know, when you push yourself across the channel. These are all natural things for carers, relatives, pe uh, healthcare professionals to care and worry about people. Absolutely. Um, but you are your own person and you are, you are a superhuman. You're a superwoman. Um, so much. And, and actually if, if people are listening today I know they, they they can't not be inspired by your story and I just a huge thank you for joining in this session with us today um, a pleasure and thank you for bringing me on and um, I just hope that something out there can help somebody who's struggling with things right now and just to know that it, it does get better um, and that sounds again such a cliche easy thing to say but it does get better and just try and find that one ray of light, that one thing that's pulling you forward, grab hold of it, and then reach out for other things. Um, but you know, it, you can do it. Thanks, Nurse. No, just a couple of messages in the chat here that I'm looking at. Um, not that I need to, to, to say these things to you, I think we've said it, but you're amazing, Nurse. You're so brave and inspirational. Uh, you're right, small changes are possible. Um, Again, so inspirational. Thank you very much. So this has been a really great talk. And I know you don't need to hear all that stuff, but um, we'd like to say it to you anyway. So <laughs> you, are, you are great. And I am proud to be your friend. And I, and I know everyone here is really appreciative of you popping on. Um, it's been lovely but, to chat with you. <laughs> good luck with all your attempts. And I guess actually maybe we should do a shout out to Blesma because that, they seem to be the people that you've actually pushed you into this position and so yeah. Blesma are a, a charity and that you people can follow them on Twitter yeah. uh, Facebook um, that's Blesma B-L-E-S-M-A isn't it yes yeah and, uh, and hopefully people might be able to help well you're doing many um, sporting events in aid of them so if anybody follows Neris hotdiver.com or something hotdiver 
Neris Pierce um, is the Just Giving Neris Pierce 13. And uh, yeah, I'm on Instagram, Neris Pierce and Twitter, Hot D Diver. Okay, lovely. Thank you, Neris. Um, well, thanks to everybody that's joined us today. I know that this will probably be live um, and also be recorded. So you might be able to like, follow on uh, you, you know, tomorrow or the next day or even a week's time. But um, thank you so much for being part of, part of the talk today. Thanks, Neris. And thank you for everybody in the room. Um, and so this is the end of the Legs, the Legs Matter live lounge today. And we'll see you all again uh, in about an hour or so, I think it is the next session. So thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thanks for having me. Bye, Nara. See you. Bye.